It's the mission of Big Walnut Schools to inspire and guide each student to his or her maximum potential. I'd like to call this meeting to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Jeremy, would you take the roll, please? Mr. Kral. Here. Ms. Storch? Here. Ms. Lee? Here. Mr. Fuji? Here. Mr. Schneider? I am here. That brings us to item five. It's recommended to the board approve the minutes for the June 18 and June 25 meetings. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Sherry. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Any comments or feedback on the minutes from any of the members? All right, I think we can call the vote, Jeremy. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. Mr. Fuji? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Ms. Lee? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. That brings us to item six in the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. Um, I want to start tonight by thanking uh, Mark, our assistant superintendent, Mark Cooper, Jen Young, our director of academics, and Laura Lawrence, our director of student services, along with our administrative assistants, Tammy, Cam, and Claire. We have had uh, quite a few emails and phone calls over the last week as people have been making their very important decision for next year. And so um, great team effort in answering those questions and talking to quite a few of our, our parents. So I thank them for that, for all their work um, in that. And Jen's gonna be sharing just momentarily on our numbers and what our plans are academically moving forward. But I just wanted to note that um, for our community members, we will continue to monitor data. And we're looking at the data. Um, I get a report on the townships and villages specifically from our health department and look, continuing to look at the data for the townships and villages that fall within Big Walnut. We will continue to monitor that as we move forward. And we are continuing to work through the thousands and thousands of logistics, it feels like, um, to get ready to open the year. So thank you to everybody for your patience and your help as we work through that process. And with that, the big focus tonight as far as reopening is going to be on our numbers that we've gotten in with folks making their selection for next year. And so I'd like to have, uh, again, Jen Young, our Director of Academics, is going to share that with you tonight. Good evening. Good evening. I wanted to start by thanking, kind of like Andy just did, our Pandemic Response Committee and the Instructional Leadership Committee. Those two groups have played a part, a large role in getting us to where we are with these reopening plans. There we go, we're on. Um, I apologize, I'm gonna use some notes tonight because as Angie said, there are thousands of details and a lot of numbers that I'm gonna throw at you right now. So starting with kind of the question that I feel like is on everyone's mind or where are the numbers shaking out? We are at, right now, 18% of our students have enrolled in our virtual learning program. So that's 706 students. The numbers across elementary high school are fairly even. They all lay right about 18%. We're at 18 for elementary, 20 for BWI, 17 for the middle school, and 17 for the high school. So right about at 18% K-12 have selected that option want to thank the parents for their patience. I know there has been some frustration about not having every detail to the VLP or our virtual learning program. The problem is we are trying to personalize that program for our students. So in a larger district, they may put out a list of courses and say this is what we're offering, but here we are really trying to make as many courses as possible um, in our VLP. So with that, we have to look at the enrollment and every student's schedule. So huge thank you to our high school admin team in particular. They have looked through over 200 student schedules. They shared a spreadsheet today. It has all 200 students, every course they're taking, what they need to graduate. So we are looking at those courses and trying to ensure that we have those courses available in our, um, for our VLP students. In our K through sixth grade, we have 40 to 60 students in just about every grade level, so K through four, anywhere from 40 to 60, 
We are currently working, and Mr. Cooper is going to share more about staffing. Just so. Take your time. Thank you. Not used to talking with a mask. So with that, we are going to. Our hope is that K six. We are going to have one of our big walnut teachers teaching K through six. At this point, I've been sharing to parents that have called them about 95% confident we're going to make that happen. That has been a big request of our parents. Kudos to our teaching staff that our parents want those teachers in front of their students. So again, that is K6. We believe we are going to use our own teaching staff to make that happen. So that will look like Google Meets, meeting with the teacher at a certain time. For example, it may be reading and science and math lessons on Monday, Tuesday, some electives and social studies, Wednesday, repeat of Monday, Thursday, repeat of Tuesday. Again, that's hypothetical. I have not worked out all, those de all of those details, but we'll certainly be using Google Meets as well as Schoology to deliver that digital curriculum. In middle school, um, we are looking to do the same thing. May look a little different. We may have teachers there that are teaching half the day in the VLP, half the day in person. So again, still working on that schedule, but hoping to have it delivered by our Big Walnut teachers. At our high school, again, we have to look through 200 plus student schedules. We are hopeful to have many of the courses taught by our Big Walnut High School teachers. However, there may be situations, one-offs we'll call them, that might only have two or three students. In that case, they may have to use a digital curriculum with just some support by our Big Walnut teacher, checking in with them weekly, seeing if they need help, office hours, that type of thing. Another question we've gotten frequently is what virtual curriculum we will be using. That is the million dollar question. Again, I can say with 95% certainty that we are gonna be choosing Edmento. The reason we will be choosing probably Edmento to be transparent, cost subscription model. Many of these, the others that we looked at, cost anywhere from 200 to $1,000 a student even per semester. So the cost would be anywhere from 65,000 to over a million dollars for the program. Edmentum is offering a one-year pilot through our ESC for $8,000. So that's a savings of 50,000 to almost a million dollars. In addition, that model is not a per student model. It is a building wide model, which is also a huge benefit. So with that, every student, 7 through 12, will have access should we go into crisis remote learning again. It's just a quick question, and Angie, maybe you want to take this one. Just, can you just kind of talk a high level? When we talk a virtual curriculum, like what, what would that typically entail when we talk a virtual curriculum? And again, Jen, feel free to jump in, but um, it, a lot of our teachers have been working hard to create lessons that can be done online, but they don't have a lot of that created because they're typically teaching in an in-person model. So that virtual curriculum has modules, lessons, units, assessments that are already built in there. So the idea is it can either be done in some ways, as Jen said, independently. In other ways, if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching eighth grade social studies, I can look at the unit I'm doing and I can assign parts of that as well as augment it with things that I want to do. So. It's really um, twofold, as Jen said. It's getting something that we can use for our students that are going to be online, at least for the first semester. But then it's also having that bank of resources for our teachers should we all be put back into crisis learning. So these could be things like readings that students are doing. Mm -hmm. Could be um, short video, video, video and activity. And audio recording, things of that nature. Yes. Could be like kind of check for understanding type quizzes and things of that nature. Maybe even assessments too. I'm mm -hmm. just talking off the top of my head. but. Yeah. Because I think that's one of those things that, you know, when you say virtual curriculum and virtual learning, it means a thousand things to a thousand different people. So I appreciate you just taking a second to kind of just sure. explain what's that in there. Because I think different people have different visions based on what their experiences have been like. One thing I want to point out when you mentioned videos, because I know as a parent, 
That makes me a little concerned. I don't want my kid watching videos all day. But the videos on Inventum, and actually most of these virtual curriculum providers, are two to three minute snippets. Very short, stop the video, do an activity, maybe watch another two minute video. So it's not like they're sitting down watching a 30 minute you know, lecture of a science lesson. Right. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, thank you. And with that, like Angie said, we have the ability to have our teachers augment that curriculum, add their things in. The nice part too is that we can use this with our students in person right away in August. So that when and if we get shut down and go into crisis remote learning, they're used to it, they're familiar, they're already in, we don't have to buy more subscriptions. So not only is it significantly more inexpensive, but the model just works a lot better for the situation. And we do have an item tonight for the board's consideration that I spoke to you about last time with actually delaying the start of school for our students so we have time to train our teachers. This would be one of those items that we'll be doing some training with them on. And with that, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna mention briefly crisis remote learning. We are going to have a plan for you at the next meeting of what that's going to look like when and if we should shut down again. Don't wanna go into details tonight because there's been a lot of confusion over the crisis remote learning plan, if we all shut down, or the VLP plan, which looks very different. So I don't wanna confuse families. We're still getting impact, um, input from our teachers and our admin team next week. So next meeting, certainly have more details for you. Questions on, I guess, the VLP, the in-person learning? I'm sure there's a lot because we've heard them all. Any on that? Um, I'll have Jen just kind of hang tight in case they have some after we're done, but I know um, Laura Lawrence, our Director of Student Services, is here, and I asked her to share a little bit. Um, we've been watching quickly as people make selections, what that looks like for our students with special needs, and thinking about um, what do those services look like in the VLP versus in person. So Laura's going to share a little on that for you. Good evening. Um, I've had a chance to talk with quite a few of our parents of our students with disabilities. Um, I felt most comfortable talking about that instead of the curriculum things. <laughs> Love that to Judd and Angie and Mark. Um, but right now we have about 22% of our students with disabilities, our students on IEPs, who have chosen uh, the remote learning or the VLP. So it's a little bit higher. Um, than the overall population, but I am not surprised about that because many of our students, especially our uh, students with more severe disabilities who are in our specialized learning centers, often they have medical needs also, and parents are choosing to keep those uh, students at home. But uh, right now we have nine of our SLC students who, who are in that category, and that presents a little bit of a difficult situation um, because they need something completely different than the rest of their peers are getting within the classrooms, whether it's in the elementary, uh, where they're getting um, reading work, math work and things, uh, because their curriculum is different, it follows the modified standards. And the middle school and high school, they certainly won't be able to follow the online Edmentum work, but we'll have to have uh, individualized work based on their IEP goals that we're looking at. Uh, one other thing that we do need to do that I've talked with parents about is look at uh, revising IEPs if we need, amending those, uh, to look to see if the goals are still specific enough that can be um, looked at in that remote setting, and specifically what we call the SDI, the Specially Designed Instruction, how the student is um, getting instruction on those goals and the accommodations that they need. Some of the things that we do within the school, we're not gonna be able to do without a teacher or an educational assistant present for them. So we will be modifying IEPs as needed. Any questions for Laura? Laura, before you run away, I don't want you to get off too easy compared to Jen, but um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about preschool? and just oh, kind of how to. that plays into everything <laughs> and, and what that kind of looks like. In the midst of all these other things that we're doing, and preschool numbers are not included uh, in what I shared here. Um, in preschool, we have a completely different situation this year because usually we have a, a model where we have eight students with disabilities and eight peer models within a classroom. So each morning classroom has 16 students and each afternoon classroom has 16 students. Job and Family Services and ODE, uh, when they reopen daycares, they changed that limit to nine students per classroom. Uh, we waited a little bit this summer, hoping that our school, our preschools that were inside our school districts and in our school buildings, that they would change that number. And I was told pl pretty clearly by ODE that that will not be happening until the governor changes all the daycare uh, things. 
Um, so with having nine students allowed per class, we had to do some restructuring of our program, got input from our parents, both our parents of students with disabilities and our peer parents, our uh, uh, um, preschool teachers, the aides, the therapists, everyone who works within that program. And we ended up deciding that should we do just all IEP students and have no peers, which are so important for our students with disabilities and with, uh, with, with parents that want their students to be in that peer program, or do we go with a small amount of peers with our IEP students? When we surveyed our parents, about 80% of them still wanted their child to be considered for a peer within the program, knowing there could only be nine students in there. So we felt pretty strongly that we needed to be able to, to make that happen for some of our peers. We decided to go with a 6-3 model, six IEP students and three peers to make that nine. We have to, by law, meet the required, um, uh, educate our students with IEPs. Some of those parents have chosen remote or itinerant services, so they won't actually be in the classroom, so that's opening up a few more um, spots for peers. But we also have to remember that any time a child turns three, we need to evaluate them if they're suspected to be, have a disability, and those students enter into the program throughout the entire year. So we have to have spots available for them in order to come in. Uh, the, the next decision we looked at was how do we decide which peers get in the program for those three peers for each classroom, for our five morning classrooms and our five afternoon classrooms. Uh, thought of lots of different things and we finally looked at the numbers and said that if we have a Monday-Tuesday group of peers and a Thursday-Friday group of peers that every peer would be able to get into the program. So that's what we ended up going with, so that parents had, had, the peers had some chance to get in, to be great role models for our students with disabilities, and to get ready for kindergarten. So right now, we've got that information back out to our parents, knowing that usually it was a four-day model for them. Usually Fridays were off for our four-day program, and we did IEP meetings, ETRs, family visits, and things on that Friday. That's going to change to the Wednesday, so that we can do a deep cleaning between the Monday-Tuesday group and the Thursday-Friday group. In reality, it's, it's only three different students in those classes, um, but it allows another 30 students to get into the program. So that's where we're at. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for asking about that. Um, did, I don't know if you mentioned, but we are also looking then at cutting the tuition in half correspondingly, just so you, if anybody asks you. So they won't be paying the same tuition rate had they been going all week. Um, it still is a loss to us, though, in revenue because we have to have the same number of staffing, but we have less typical peers that are paying that tuition. So it is yet another uh, hit to us because of a, a mandate change. And I can add with the staff, for our educational assistance, for anything over six students, you need a teacher and a sec second adult, which are our educational assistants. So even though we're only at nine instead of 16, we still have to have that extra teacher within the room or the extra adult within the room. And you may have noticed that we um, did have our fee schedule for the, for the next school year on at one point on our agenda or had talked about doing it. Um, but just as we can work out some of the details, we did pull it for this meeting and we will um, make those appropriate corrections and bring that before the board again for approval. <laughs> I think it's important to note too, kind of to Angie's point about um, the preschool tuition that we will be losing revenue also from our full day kinder program because those kinder students who've chosen, and I believe we're 56, who've chosen VLP, that's a half day program. So losing that tuition as well from that full day program. And that's a good segue. Anything else from either of you two? Um, I wanted Mark to talk just a little bit about kind of where we are with staffing these two models then. I would say to also just to our community and parents um, who are waiting to hear some answers on the VLP, what I have been saying is give us two weeks and we should be able to have schedules and someone contacting you about curriculum. Um, so hang tight and we will return those answers to you as soon as possible. Thank you. And Jen kind of spoke already a little bit to the staffing and, and how we would look. You know, um, ideally, the number of kids that come out create spaces for teachers. Um, when you have community schools, like we do with our elementaries, it doesn't always work out one for one. So if you take 20 kids out of a first grade, it doesn't necessarily equate to one teacher because it's not specifically those 20 kids coming from one building. And so it has been very logistical, <laughs> a logistical challenge on things. Uh, we continue to watch it. We continue to look at things um, as far as 
um, just those numbers within the classroom because it's not just a matter of trying to stay with our typical aspirational goals. We are trying to get below those to be at more distancing within the classroom. Um, it is not the ideal situation, uh, but we do believe we have numbers down quite a bit, especially at the elementary levels right now. Uh, we're looking on average to around 19, 20 students per classroom. Typically our, our class size is around 25. Um, that's our aspirational goal, I should say. Um, so we do have more students in that VLP per grade level than a typical class size. You might see 40 kids or so in, in, one, of the, uh, in one grade level having one teacher oversight of that, but then that may create some opportunities for us to look at some of the use of our teaching assistants, some of the use of some instructional tutors to support those teachers, um, as well as being able to pull some small groups, meet with some small groups through Google Meets, et cetera, uh, by doing that. And so it's not a perfect one-for-one -one match um, when we look at class size versus teachers within the buildings, but we do see as of right now that we will be able to staff this at about uh, 19 to 20 students per class on average. Uh, we do have some class sizes down around 16. Our highest class size at the elementary level, I believe right now is 24. That's at a fourth grade level. Um, we still have a few students that didn't select from that building on the remote option, so we are following up with them. And uh, I would expect that to still go down a little bit uh, for those fourth grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. And that's specifically at one building as of right now. So. Again, a lot of staffing uh, decisions to make on things. As of right now, we um, have budgeted for five teachers um, to be added to the elementary, um, to the overall elementary level this coming year. Uh, as we spoke at the last board meeting, we were able to cut it down to three ads uh, because we utilize instructional facilitators, putting them back into the classroom. So we were down to three. As of right now, we are looking to add one teacher uh, based off of what our numbers are. That helps us with the deficit spending that we're expecting to see next year. Um, it doesn't help us get out of deficit spending by any means, but it would uh, help with that. Um, what you'll see with the ad right now is that the preschool teacher tonight that is on the agenda is actually taking the place of a preschool teacher that would take the place of one of those ads at, at third grade level. And so uh, what you'll see tonight is technically an ad to an FTE overall. It's not an ad to our preschool level. Any questions on that? Maybe not specific to that, but I guess could one or both of you speak to um, new enrollment and growth? I mean, I know homes are still being built and things of that nature. And if you could just talk about how that's playing into the the complexity of trying to put this puzzle together. Yeah, Nija, I don't know if you have those updated numbers. I know you're yeah, taking a look right there. Here. We we are continuing to track on a daily basis um, those updated numbers. Um, it is some conversation we've even had on some of that of how do we maintain some of the class sizes in person if we continue to have some enroll coming in here at the end of July, beginning of August, um, through really even the end of August at this point as, as we're looking at delaying start a little bit. Um, so we are going to continue to track those numbers, um, you know, as far as being able to allow those students into the in-person versus forcing them to, an, to an, a remote learning is something that we are considering at this point uh, for any new students that are being enrolled to the district. Again, trying to keep those numbers as low as possible in person for the students that have already selected at this point. And we have 120 so far that have enrolled over the summer, um, which I would say is on the low end of par for this time of year. We usually get a little rush in August, especially with kindergartners. Um, but I, I can share that we've got 23 in process of new homeschool students. So our net may not be as large as it typically is, um, just given the situation. Okay. Yeah, I feel like we have seen a, l a lot less a of an enrollment different. in July and into June for sure, mm -hmm. with uh, a lot less transitioning and people being able to move around. If I might ask, how many withdrawals? We don't really get that. That's where I can tell you the net when school starts because typically we don't get many withdrawals until school starts. We find out on the first day they've gone somewhere and then they can't enroll somewhere else until they withdraw from us and then, then they show up and withdraw. But okay. yeah, we usually don't get much over the summer with that. Are you anticipating a larger number of withdrawals, people going to online? That's where like the homeschool possibly. We, we could see more of that than we typically do. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I think that net gain is going to be lower than it typically is this year. But we'll be able to share that um, a little more in about a month. 
you know, to Angie's point, legally we can't withdraw a student until we actually get a request of record from the other district that they're enrolling to. <coughs> and so some may choose to not enroll until the very end of August, and so we won't know those numbers until closer to September time frame. Any other questions for anyone on our team on this issue? Okay. Thank you. And I know that those kind of bled together with Jen's academic report. Did you have anything else you wanted to share there, Jen, or did you kind of cover it with the, okay. Obviously that's the big topic starting school right now when it comes to academics. Um, with that, we will transition away from restarting school and academics into building new schools and construction. So we have Doug Swartz, our director of facilities, and he's gonna give his update and also talk tonight um, with some of our contractors about the site athletic package. Good evening. So we're going to first walk through the three reports you're used to receiving, the monthly report and the two financial reports. I'm going to start with the monthly report. Again, it's the one with the fun pictures on it. And as I've done several months in a row now, I highlighted a few things I just want to draw your attention to, although it's all important. Um, again, on the site work, just to share, and this we're going to talk about in greater detail, we're looking to complete the sanitary lift station. I'm going to talk more about that in a second and what that's uh, doing to us in terms of completing the elementary school. Um, probably another critical thing is since we're about to open in the near future, you'll see under site we're at the point we've got to start planning to separate the elementary as open and the high school and future site athletics package as still construction zone. So you'll see a temporary fence going up in the very immediate future and some signage and whatnot to safely control uh, a kid, student, staff, community area versus contractors to the north of us. On the elementary and central plant, I just highlighted the fun and obvious at the bottom. Owner moving in August. So we're still on track. As the date shows now, we're still scheduled to have our moving team be able to arrive the morning of the 7th. We're talking about starting the pack the afternoon of the 6th. Uh, store that in a safe place and probably inside our warehouse, the, the, the panel truck and start first thing Friday morning and loading in the PRE with a completion sometime on Monday the 10th. Teachers start arriving on Monday the 10th. Principal somewhere around the 6th or 7th as well as her admin team, uh, admin building secretary. The high school, we're making great progress. We're probably about a week ahead of schedule um, for what that's worth, knowing that we're looking back again, again into the fourth quarter of 21 to complete and start school in January of 22. Um, what's significant, start to take shape is if, as if next time you get your tour, for instance, we're actually starting brick veneer on the outside of one of the areas, that's the gymnasium area, and starting roofing in that area as well as one of the classroom wings. So again, the goal is to try and, as it always is with construction, get as much under roof and enclosed as winter begins approaching here in several months. So we're on track or slightly ahead is what, what I'm in discussions with Gilbane with. Um, other than that, in terms of the move, done several walkthroughs with the principal. The staff got to visit it last week in small groups, uh, social distance and all the right protocols. Um, they seemed really excited, uh, had a few questions we were able to answer. So again, I think they're ready to uh, move forward and as they feel appropriate, they're allowed in the building the 10th, although again, remind everyone contractually the 17th is their first day of work. So I'll stop there, any questions on the Monthly report or the opening of the school? I know I kind of breezed over that a little bit. Okay, so the next report, sorry about the color, turned kind of yellowish green on the front. I want you to go to the very last page. This is the report of how we're spending our contingency. So owner, owner changes or changes against the owner's contingency, not necessarily owner's changes. I wanted to bring up, you'll see a column, about the sixth or seventh column over that says PCI. It has some green dots on it. I wanted to go PCI 239, lift station groundwater. So the very last page, uh, Mr. Fuji, I'm just looking around. So very last page, all the way in the back, and go to what's number 239, and it's entitled Bulletin 211, lift station groundwater. What I simply want to share is we've hit an aquifer. We have a lift station, which in simple terms allows us to pump our sanitary from our site down about 1.1 miles to the closest structure that the village has for their sewer system. Um, we're down, if I remember correctly, at least 25 feet. And unfortunately, we hit an aquifer 
we were pumping at one time a week ago 15,000 gallons a minute. By the time we had three different pumps we brought in over the last 40, 30 to 40 days as it became a more and more of a challenge. Good news is, and the, I'll ask the Gilpain folks possibly to elaborate a little bit if you have further questions, um, it's sort of like a cake. You've got to get that water down, put some concrete in, and you start building up to get that structure or that pump, essentially, that lift installed. It's installed. Uh, we're backfilling around. We're starting to wire and do final pipe connections. So at one point, we were sliding into the week of the 10th. Now we're hoping we can still land easily into the week of the 3rd, uh, plus or minus, with the move still, it appears, not in jeopardy to start uh, the morning of the 7th. So all I wanted to share is there will be some money there. You can see it's got $10,000. I have a feeling that'll probably grow to 40 or 50,000 by the time we get all the time tickets and costs for these pumps and consultants that have been brought in to try and deal with this uh, fun water challenge um, to get us to be able to use our sanitary system. So that's really, as, as I've said to Angie, that's probably the thing that's driving our, we're, we're certified, the, the inspectors are done and we can move in. We obviously need the plumbing system to work. Um, but all the other systems are on track, fire alarm, phones, data, you name it to support any of the other life safety things are moving forward and on or ahead of schedule at this point. This is kind of the lagging item that needs to catch up and is slowly catching up. So I'll stop there if you have any questions on the lift station or where we are with the new school. Okay, and the final report is Gil Baines, it's the, the one pager. Again, it looks like a spreadsheet, one pager. They have items one through 20. I just wanted to point out number 20. Again, they, they are constantly looking at ways to efficiently and effectively manage the project. And we're in limited fashion, use contingency owner, under owner, and arch, owner rep and architect approval. Just wanted to point that out, number 20, moisture mitigation in the elementary. <coughs> Excuse me. That was again, so we, we had a little bit of moisture in the slab. Got to get that out so we can get the gym floor down. So again, it buys them a few more days is all it's doing to try and stay ahead or on schedule. So that's what most of these are, those type of items. But I just wanted to point that one out as very relevant to where we stand now in terms of completing the school. And you can still see they have a, a fairly large amount left as a percentage of, of quote unquote their contingency. So I'll stop there. Any questions on that or the other two reports? Okay, so want me to go on the next one, Angie? Yes, please. Okay, <clears throat> so the other reason we're here tonight, and that's why you see so many uh, of our team members here, is per board protocol, we're going to tonight present and discuss only, no vote, um, what we believe will be the last GMP amendment to Gilbane's contract. It's GMP 5, and it's for site athletics. So as I sent out yesterday, we've been talking about this a long time, really started having robust discussions back in January. Tonight we're gonna have Chris Dumford with VSWC walk you through big picture, where the scope is again. And then Chad Stevers and Jeffrey Bauman from Gilbane are gonna come up, just as Bob Sewell was not able to make it, so Chad is another project executive with Gilbane. Walk you through those project summer reports we had where they talk about the budget. We're about $200,000 over as a project slash the athletics budget. And where we are in terms of that process and where if awarded, where this brings their contract to hold. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Chris, do you want to stand? I need to log that back in for you. Do you want to stand there or here? And should Probably I get? Over here. Uh, Is there a way to get him the mic or should I stand over there, Wayne? Yeah, grab one of theirs. Can you, so borrow Sherry's, sorry. I probably need to log in. Just a second. So while he gets me back in there, I'll um, I'll just say a few words. Uh, I'm gonna. I just have a few drawings. I think you've all seen these drawings recently. I think Doug sent them out. Um, just kind of going over, reminding people what the scope is um, overall for the project, and then just specifically with the athletic um, pieces. So this is the overall project site. You can see the elementary school, which is almost um, complete. The high school is under construction. Um, the road to the south is cut off so that on this image, just so it's a little bit larger scale. So the athletic facilities, the northwest corner of the site are practice fields. So those um, are, are being um, graded out, but um, those aren't really, th those are all part of the, the general grading associated with the site work. 
um, kind of going from left to right um, clockwise around the top. Tennis courts up on the top. It's, it was master plan for 10 tennis courts. Five of them are in this current phase. So we're, we're proposing the five at the back be built first and then the five in, in the front would be uh, for future. Master plan for four ball fields, two baseball, two softball. Two of those are part of the current scope being proposed in this GMP. The two on the east, baseball and softball. Both of those fields um, in the current scope have synthetic turf on the infield and then natural grass on the outfield. Moving on around, the uh, stadium is on the far east. Synthetic turf on the stadium. Um, synthetic track surface around and then also synthetic traffic sur track surfacing in the uh, the end uh, the D areas with the where the field events are uh, home bleachers and visitor bleachers and I'll talk a little bit more about the bleachers in a minute and then kind of in between there this building here is the concession building which again I'll show you a blow up of that building um, that's a small piece of this but that's actually one of the biggest cost pieces because it's, it's an actual structure has a lot of bathrooms um, in it Nestled in between here, just north of the stadium are the shot put and discus areas um, out in the field. And then there's a little athletic storage building nestled in there and then some batting cage uh, netted areas. And there is a space reserved for a future batting building up there, which really is nothing more than just some space allotted at this point. Um, in terms of utilities throughout here, we have um, as part of the scope of the, the project, a couple of um, wells being built at, out of the practice fields just for um, watering out there. So they're just they're wells with um, a, uh, a connection in the top, um, not not an underground piped system, but just a uh, well out there so you can uh, attach a hose and a, 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 a crawling type sprinkler out there. Um, at the baseball fields, we have a little bit of, or at the tennis course, I mean, we have a little bit of electric out there for some um, tennis ball machines, so forth, no lighting. At the baseball fields, we do have a scoreboard for each each one of the baseball and softball. And then there is some electric out there for pitching machines and so forth. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, there's one flagpole in between the two ball fields with a light on the top of that. And there, uh, around the, the concession building, has it, it's fully powered. It has air conditioning in the, the ticket area and the concession area. And then uh, it's, it's heated in the, in the rest of it. Um, there's some area lighting around that and, and the, um, that whole part of the site there, there has lighting so that it can be used um, after hours. And then the stadium is the only area that has um, athletic lighting. So it, it has full um, field lighting for, uh, for night games. Um, the, it, I'm, the next slide I'm going to show you is talking about the concession building. Any, any questions on the overall site or scope? So the concession building here, this is the floor plan of the building, and it has three main um, sections. It has a ticketing section at the um, towards the bottom of the page here. It has restrooms in the center, and it has concessions uh, on the which is the field side. And this diagram, the field would be up and to the right. There's also a little maintenance area. Um, this is the same basic plan that we've had, though it does have more fixtures in it than the last time. If if we showed this to you um, a few months ago, and the reason for that is we sent this in for plan review. And um, so all, um, according to the building code, there would be um, like 70 fixtures, uh, toilets and urinals required in a building of this size because of the capacity, which is a lot more than you certainly currently have and a lot more than is usually deemed necessary for um, a high school. Um, but in order to provide less, we have to go for a variance. We applied for a variance. And the good news is they granted us the variance. The bad news is that they modified the number of fixtures we were proposing. So they said, yes, we'll grant it. But instead of providing roughly half the fixtures that are required by code, you need to provide 60% of the fixtures required by code, which means we had to add back in several fixtures. So we redesigned it a little bit. We were able to shoehorn in a few more fixtures and a few more sinks. So um, this has not been resubmitted yet, but we do believe it is compliant now. So it did drive up the cost of the concession building. A little bit but it did not get any bigger so we were able to keep it within the same footprint but anyway so that that is the um, kind of the, the capacity or the the layout of the facility as it stands um, the restrooms are able to be divided into home and visitor 
for um, events where that is um, desirable or they can be opened up and be shared for events where that's not necessary. Um, the concession also has one side dedicated for home and one side with, for visitors with a fence in between them so those sides can be kept separate. That was something that was important to the um, athletic director. Um, any questions on the concession? Okay. Um, the bleacher plan, I want to mention this briefly because uh, this has been through several design iterations. This looks a little bit different because this is actually a drawing that was generated by the bleacher manufacturer that we're working with. Um, so we had an original bleacher design that we, we um, bid that was based on um, some other um, a design that has been used with some, uh, for with some other school districts that um, had the handicapped seating in front of the cross aisle. So there's some advantage to that that, that was desired. Um, we submitted it for review and it was um, denied under plan review as not complying with the handicap code. Um, so there's a, um, which was kind of frustrating because that same design has been approved by other jurisdictions, but they don't count precedent. Um, so they said it didn't comply. And um, so we were in a situation where we needed to, we, we could either um, appeal it, but um, based on the input we got, they were going to, um, not support our appeal so we thought that that was a losing battle so we went back and worked out a revised design with the bleacher manufacturer so this is a more traditional design um, oddly enough the seats are not as good for the handicap seating but it does comply with the handicap code more uh, completely so um, the other good news of this is that it, it, it is a less expensive design so we were able to save some money on the, uh, the overall bleacher design um, or another way of looking at it was get some um, additional value in the bleacher design that was desired um, by the uh, by the um, athletic director and the um, uh, the other folks who had interest in this. So um, it's a pretty standard design, um, but it it um, it is a little simpler than we had. But that's that's part of the um, what's in the GMP now. Um, it has the uh, the same capacity. We we've been designing it according to the, the same capacity, which um, I believe is there. You go. Thirty-two forty-six is the total capacity on the home side, and it's about seven fifty on the on the visitor side. So that that's really the overview that I was uh, that I wanted to share. I do have more documents here. If you have specific questions on other areas, I can pull up information, zoom in. Um, or I can sit down. <laughs> Specific to the, the bleacher piece, I know in the past design there was discussion of the ability to expand and add on. Is that yes. still possible with this design? Yes. So um, with a 100-acre uh, you know, site, um, you, you go into it thinking that you have all kinds of room, but as everything was stacked up, we were actually sort of condensed in the east to west direction with the parking lots and with the um, uh, power and water easements coming in so forth um, but we did build the stands as deep as we could to get to stay within the setback along the east side build the stadium and, and to stay on um, out of uh, one of the um, the easements that was running through the site um, so it is it is deep you'll notice that there's a cross aisle at the back that's required after you get to a certain depth you have to have a back cross aisle so it is deeper than some stadiums that are that are built um, but we, we intentionally went deep so that um, it was not as wide. Now, this is still a, a pretty a pretty long stands, and they go to like the like the ten yard line, I think, right. is about right yes. on on each end. So it's going pretty far, but but there is room to add essentially another bay on each end and still be within the um, you know like the football field. You know, the seats get worse as you get out, obviously, but but the, it does it is able to be expanded and. Uh, pretty simply, you know, we have these ramps on the side. If you were to expand in the future, you would just take this ramp off, build another section or a half section, and put the ramp back on and extend the front. Um, so yes, yes, still um, extendable. Um, there, um, there is some impact on the the site lighting, um, and I think we're okay. So. The site lighting was originally designed to be behind the, the stands completely. And um, uh, in 
some of the uh, discussions of cost savings, one of the cost saving measures, if, if we could bring, bring the site lighting in on the sides, sides of the stadium and in a little bit, um, we could save, and it was pretty significant, it was like $40,000 we could save. Um, and I think we, that is on the list of what we're recommending as part of that. So that was a cost savings. That does impact the additions you put on the side, but not that much. So it, it would make either the additions on the side would need to be shorter, or if they were as deep, you would have some obstructed views. But as we talked through this with the facilities committee, that was a recommendation that they thought that that was a cost savings that would probably be worth um, worth doing. So um, the positioning of those lights does impact the addition, but not it doesn't preclude that from happening. Okay, any other questions or? Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit before we bring Chad up, Mr. Stevers up. Um, many of the board members participated. So again, in addition to this, as the process has always been, being vetted through the design team, which includes the owner's team, the architect, Gilbane, et cetera. You may recall the notes I gave you yesterday. At one point, we were about a million over um, until we came back to the facilities team where we were about 163, made some choices, both add and deduct. One of them Chris just elaborated on was a savings of about 40,000. Uh, there were two others just to share. One was um, eliminating one of the platforms. Uh, there are two large viewing platforms on either side of the press box at the top of the, and so that was agreed to eliminate one of them. Um, leaving one still gives us an area to uh, videotape and have cameras and record and also kind of have a, what they've termed affectionately a, a, a rental opportunity potentially for alumni or stuff to have larger groups. Um, and then most importantly that the team came to a decision of, so those were both savings of about 55,000. Um, the team came to a conclusion though to include uh, the storage building that Chris alluded to that was just north of the concession building. That was about a $70,000 add in the other direction. So our, our net result between uh, going back and clarifying other costs Gilbane had, we went from 163 over during the facilities committee meeting. Now we're just over 200,000 just to share. But I just wanted to let you know, so we went through the entire list. It's not our intention to go through that whole list tonight. Uh, we've been through it as a team multiple times, the facilities team. Graciously, I see three board members that were on that virtual call. I think it took us two and a half hours to go through that list line by line and made three decisions, which I think were the right ones. Um, so tonight we're more just presenting that as information. If you have questions, we're not going to walk through that document. And with that, I'll stop there real quick in case you have any questions before uh, Chad comes up. Okay, so I'm going to ask Chad to come to the microphone. Again, Chad's going to walk you through two documents Bob usually did. One, where is the entire project at? And where are we in terms of their contract just to share and how does that affect what, we, what we'd be coming back to you August 13th potentially to award to them? Thanks. Thanks. I don't think it's very fair that Chris got to show all the pretty pictures and all the cool stuff you're going to get, and I got to tell you how much all this stuff's going to cost you. But, uh, yeah, so Sewell, Mr. Sewell has has presented the previous four uh, GMPs one through four. As Doug said, this is GMP five; it's the last one. And uh, Bob said, "You guys are a pretty easy group as long as you see me smile." So I want you to know that <laughs> underneath here, I got a big smile going on. So. The overall project cost, if, I think there were some handouts provided at your seats. Uh, <clears throat> you see the GMPs listed there, one through five. Um, as Doug said, this is the last one. It, it's for the stadium, which is what Chris was presenting up there. It also includes uh, the, the high school furniture. So <clears throat> that wraps up. You're 100% bought out then. There's no more GMPs, no more, um, no more budget discussion, if you will, as far as you know more pieces to add on to the to the project so those total up to 93.5 million um, you see that down below in the final cost column if you add that plus the the 13.2 million of non-construction costs uh, that brings us to that 1067 number it's kind of highlighted in uh, gray color um, <clears throat> there's a two two other items highlighted in gray um, the OFCI equipment which is your uh, a lot of your technology, actual pieces and parts that's being owner furnished equipment. And then <clears throat> the 330 uh, for the 
agreement between the village and the district. Um, that brings us to 2.7, which that was added to the 104.8 previously, which gave us a total all-in project cost or budget, I should say, of 107.5. Where we sit right now is 107.7 with everything in the athletics um, that the, all the committees wanted and people wanted. So um, <clears throat> it's roughly, like Doug said, 201,000 over right now. If you go to the next page, it kind of breaks down GMP5. It's a single page spreadsheet. Um, <clears throat> it lists out the bid packages uh, for the for all the athletics, and then there's just a placeholder for high school furniture. Um, we we have vetted that. I don't know if Chris talked a lot about that, but that's been uh, we did that package design assist with lofts, same as the elementary. Um, we're actually tracking a little bit under that 1.5 million dollar allowance for for furniture. I think everybody feels fairly confident to get everything in there, but it's not um, completely vetted yet. It's close, and I think talked about coming back at a couple future board meetings to present the actual furniture to the board um, but we're confident in that number is enough to buy the furniture for the high school um, <clears throat> a lot of the contractors you see there are ones you're probably familiar with from previous um, previous uh, GMPs out here because they're a lot of them are common they've worked on the CEP the elementary and the high school uh, there's a lot of economies of scale to save money, they're already on site, they're already mobilized. They were pretty cost competitive uh, for, for the stadium project. We do have some new faces in here, but uh, we've got a good group of contractors, we've got good competitive numbers. Uh, so this, this GMP5 is that 8.868276 that we're asking for the board to, to review tonight. So I guess we just want to uh, elaborate on the fact or focus on it. I had it in some of those minutes I sent you uh, last night, but I know you guys have a lot of things going on. Uh, 2.7, as Chad alluded to, was what was added uh, in order to get us out of balance. At that time, it was a projected cost for site athletics. Um, as you can see, we've come in a little bit higher. Some of that Chris alluded to in terms of the number of toilets. We've had some other challenges with bidding and whatnot. Um, and so we, we've got it where we were. We were a million over at one point, so we're down to 200,000. Uh, we do, I'm, I'm going to speak for Jeremy and then ask him to speak. We do have, remember he talked about all the way back in January, we had roughly 2.9 million in interest and unassigned bond money. That was in January. So we're a little shy. If you take that 2.9 million, we're tens of thousands shy, roughly. 6,584 shy. Um, so with that, I'll defer to Jeremy. We've already discussed, do we have 6584 in the bank, if you will, to pay for this should the board agree to go forward? Again, tonight you're just reviewing it. You're not voting. <coughs> and, and I do want to, uh, again, go back to we're showing that we were at a delta of 2.7. But if you recall our, our conversations again from January, um, at that point in time, we had $1.2 million that were on allocated bonds. Um, so proceeds that could be put towards this project as well as at that point in time uh, we had 1.7 million dollars of interest that had been posted to our books and in the bank which gave us 2.9 million dollars um, so as we look look here we still have those funds it's still available and we have continued to accrue uh, additional interest over the last uh, several months um, so with only being 6,584 over that uh, 2.9 million, we, have, we do definitely have that amount of funds to be able to use for the project. So um, we, we have the amount to cover this delta and, uh, and some additional interest that has continued to accrue. So I guess, again, just want to share where we were, where the delta is, what the scope is, and that, and as Jeremy said, we believe we have the, the funds to fund the delta, as was shared even back in January. We just didn't need to allocate all of it at that time. Um, I'll remind the board, there are there is a path. If you say, I want to get to zero, uh, the facilities team vetted that. The, the biggest chunk of that is cutting, take these off, cutting seats. 
cut but, 500 seats, it's $100,000. But, but I, I, so I, I do want to go. I do want to go back to that. Our conversation in January was that to move forward with planning a facility, and we talked about having $2.9 million. Right now, we're at $2.7 million. Right. So, um, it, definitely welcome continued conversation. But to say that we are over by the 2.1 or 201,000, if we continue to go back to that right. 2.9, we're really not over 200,000. We have. I think we have planned prudently. We've designed prudently at only allocating $2.7 million as our target. But January, we said we, we were willing to potentially commit $2.9 million. So. And I just want to clarify, when Doug's saying the facilities team, that's the board's community-based facility, facility committee. committee and that's why the board members are able to be there. It's a board committee. Um, and that's the group that we've been working with since before we passed the bond to build the building. So I just want to point out that's who, that's who he's referencing there and um, appreciate their time and, and making some recommendations to us the other night. So questions for Doug or the rest of the construction team from the board? Thank you very much. Thank and you. Mr. Schneider, I believe that is all I have tonight, unless you have anything else for me. I don't think so. I think we're ready to move to item eight, which is the treasurer's report. Okay. Um, I will start with just a brief update. I know when we had talked last that um, the governor had mentioned that there would potentially be additional funds coming. Um, and we, we have gotten uh, some additional information on that, a, a initial estimate. I think I shared that earlier, but in case um, the community or uh, members of the board have not been able to see that, at this point in time, it is looking like um, they're called the coronavirus relief funds. And those are funds that have been allocated from the federal government to the governor then to be used at uh, various levels of, of government. Um, our, our portion appears to be about 200,000. And um, I, I guarantee that we will be able to use those. Uh, if you look at just the cost of um, masks for sanitizing, for um, all of the other things that are being put into uh, best practices and guidance to reopen our schools, um, we, we will be using that $200,000. Uh, but did want to, uh, again, since I had mentioned that at our last meeting, wanted to make sure that I gave you an update then once I had heard more about that. Um, I guess any, any questions on that or other items before I briefly touch on uh, the June uh, kind of final numbers? So to clarify, is that $200,000 above and beyond what was heretofore known as, quote unquote, the CARES Act dollars of well, roughly 170, 175, yeah. yeah. Yes, it, it is. It is additional funds on top of that. Um, and, and I guess as we're talking about funds also, um, as we've, we've started this new fiscal year, our, our state revenues are at that, um, kind of net amount, House Bill 164 gave us back some of those funds, and that is the level that we're being funded at. It's about 9% under what we would hope to be receiving, um, but it is not at the 14.7 reduction that we had seen in, in May. Thank you. Uh, so with that, the last item, I just wanted to go over the numbers. Hopefully you were able to see our financial report. Um, with the, our, our revenues definitely did come under, uh, as we've been discussing ever since May, uh, with those, uh, with the reductions we saw in state funding. Um, but was happy that many of the business practices, hard work that, um, the, the hard decisions that the board has made, uh, hard uh, decisions that the uh, administration as well as our staff have been making um, and adjusting to some of the, the rising costs that we've been seeing over the years, are, are, you can see are, are paying off. Um, 
And as I, I think I shared in my Eagle Examiner, Examiner article, some of just what we were seeing um, savings from being in a remote learning um, environment at the very end of the, the fiscal year. Uh, we did also see some savings there. So all of those things combined uh, allowed us to, to come in under what we had originally anticipated on the expenditure side. And uh, uh, with all of that hard work, even with our lost revenue, um, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, we were able to have another balanced year of uh, revenues and expenditures. It, um, I can't stress enough, though, how much hard work, how many um, really, really, I guess, from a, both a staffing standpoint and things we would want for our students, um, the, the, how we're continuing to try to do what we can with, uh, with less. And um, I think I've shared this during my, my forecast presentations. There becomes that breaking point, though, where you, you just you can't, you can't cut anymore and still have uh, what I think our, our community is asking for. Um, but with that, very happy to see where we did, we did land again this year. So that is what I had for, for today. Anything for Jeremy on the financial report? Okay. That brings us to item 9.1. It's recommended to the board approve the following new policy. 5460.02, students at risk of not qualifying for high school diploma. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Leanna. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. And I know it says Mr. Cooper on there, but actually, uh, Laura Lawrence is going to rejoin us up at the podium as Director of Student Services. She was uh, working on this policy. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is the one Tammy told me that we had made a policy, I think this is the one, of our own, and made up a number for it years ago. And now this one came along, and that's the number it's assigned in the system. So there is a little bit of clerical changing around there if, if you happen to see when you look it up. So this is a brand new policy that is required to be adopted. We didn't have it previously. Yeah, and I didn't know that we had. Is that on, Wayne? Is it up? Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't know we needed to do it either until we got it. And uh, Andy uh, Jados and Kelly Bloomer and I looked at it, and then I worked with Kelly specifically through the details. We're already doing a lot of this, identifying our students who are at risk at not graduating. Each of our students at the high school in the winter leading up into the spring meet with their counselor and they look at what credits they have, what classes they need to take, what classes they want to take, looking at their future plans and things. So that already is happening as a meeting in a and we call that that graduation plan. We're changing the name of it now. <laughs> but when they go through their list of credits and what classes that they need to take. Um, for identifying the students, uh, we felt we, we just left A in there that we have to include. Uh, the lack of adequate progress in meeting the terms of the graduation plan because we figure those other things all go into that. Students who have excessive tardiness or absences that may lead to them not doing well, it, it may not be a problem with their graduation, um, with their discipline or having a certain number of semesters with certain grades, we didn't want to, to look at that. Um, we thought just by looking with the school counselor and the student, looking to see their credits that we could tell those students who are at risk. Uh, oftentimes we know those students coming into ninth grade who may be at, at risk for that. The thing that we did need to add is the parent notice. Uh, although parents do know that the student is meeting with the counselor, we thought if they are, looks like the child's going to be deficit in credits, we're going to make sure that the parent gets a copy of that, a record of when the uh, uh, student met. Uh, so that we cover that part and the interventions and supports needs to be written on there now. So where we might ha have a student placed in guided study hall instead of a regular study hall to get some more support or changing their class to a co-taught class, uh, even though they may not be an IEP uh, student but needs more support in a certain class to say like if it's an algebra class. Um, some students going into small group learning of the specialized learning center if it might be needed. We have a few students who we do that with mental health services through Justin Plummer or Ohio Guidestone or Centero. We still have all those in place that, that students can use. Uh, Apex classes that a student might look at for, for credit recovery. 
So it's a lot of things that we were doing. We just need to modify that form a little bit. Kelly's going to work with the school counselors as soon as they get back and then share that with me. And I, I think that we're in good shape. Thank you, Laura. Any questions for her? All right. Thank you. There's no questions or no further discussion. Jeremy, I'll go ahead and have you call the vote. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Fuji? Yes. Mr. Crowell? Yes. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. And Mr. Schneider? Yes. Item number 10 is board members' items of interest, and I think I'll just work it from left to right tonight, and Sherry, we'll start with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to take the opportunity um, right now to thank all of the community members who have reached out with questions or concerns regarding decisions that um, the board and administration has made over the last month. We're definitely blessed to have a community that is passionate about our learners and passionate about education. Uh, much of the correspondence has been addressed to the entire board or to the board uh, and administration. And in most, if not all cases, our president or vice president or the superintendent has sent a reply. Um, I typically don't send an additional response unless I believe I have relevant data to add to the conversation. Um, but I do read all of this correspondence. I reflect upon it. And I use all of these comments and, and questions that come up to influence my outside reading and research. So I draw upon all of this in decision making down the road. The decisions we're making this summer are definitely not easy ones. So. Uh, everyone on this board has children or grandchildren attending school here. These decisions touch us personally. We all have opinions about what might be best for our own families. And to be perfectly honest, having three kids, that might mean three different things. Uh, but we can't do what is best for our own kids. We have to consider every child in this district every parent in this district, every grandparent in this district, and the community as a whole, and make the tough decisions that provide the greatest good to everyone. I personally believe that the key to a successful return to school is how we, as a community, protect each other on a daily basis. And that doesn't begin on the first day of school. That begins now. Maintaining social distancing whenever possible to limit the time spent in very close proximity with a large number of people and wearing facial coverings are scientifically proven ways to reduce the spread of this virus. And these, as well as trying to keep yourself and your family's activities limited to those that are low risk and low exposure as much as you possibly can and maintaining good hygiene practices are critically important to keep everyone in the family healthy. Keeping each family healthy keeps our community healthy. And if we, can com if we can prevent community spread, the better chance we have to keep our kids in school. It takes each one of us committing to do our part to make that happen. Okay, secondly, a big thank you to everyone working with, in, and around the schools to prepare for the coming school year. That includes our administration team, our teachers, janitors, construction workers, everybody coming together to try to brainstorm, plan, build, organize, and otherwise prepare in what is truly an extraordinary time. I appreciate everyone's time, hard work, and ingenuity on finding ways to move forward. I understand that there are still a lot of unknowns, and I realize that that is uncomfortable, but we will work through all of the details by coming together as a team. Third, I just wanted to publicly thank Angie and Brad for their words in the most recent Eagle Examiner. Uh, equal rights and respect for others can never be overlooked, especially when we are in crisis mode. I appreciate your acknowledgments that our district is imperfect. It does us no good to pretend that our community is immune to bias or discrimination, but understanding where we are and staying committed to promoting and teaching behaviors that exhibit self-awareness, empathy, and respect for all are key. And that's important both in school and at home. So thank you both. And thank you for the time to share my thoughts. Thank you. Doug. I just had a couple of things uh, and some of his questions. 
on the masks for elementary age children. We've got it at third grade. State order is 10 years, and the CDC is 10 years. Seems to me like it'd be a little easier if that was moved up to the fifth grade level. So, as is the case with a lot of things lately, <laughs> changes constantly. Um, when the governor put out the guidance that we were awaiting on July 2nd, um, his recommendation at that point, which we then took back to our committee and, and the feedback that we received was we should follow what was being recommended with that, was that they be required in grades 3 through 12 and strongly recommended in K2. So that, uh, that is what we went with based on the feedback we got from the, the committee at that time. Um, after that, he came out with the mask orders, which put 10 as the level. And I don't know if that's because something changed that he's pulling upon or, or why the discrepancy. Um, we probably don't have a, a lot of 10-year-old third graders, but that, that's the reason for the discrepancy. So we are, um, I, I assure you, I have a third grader, and he listened to the governor live, and when they said third grade and up, he and my niece cheered because they forgot they moved into third grade in the fall. They thought they were still second graders. So <laughs> I know that, uh, you know, not everyone is thrilled about that, but we felt that being in line with that recommendation and especially based off the feedback that we got from the committee that that was appropriate. Uh, the other is the rehearsal tomorrow mm -hmm. and the elimination of being able to get graduate in the ceremony if you didn't make it to the rehearsal. And I understand the dynamics there and that it, was be it has been very fluid, but some of the kids that will be graduating are working and getting less than a seven day notice form mm -hmm. to get that off might be an issue. I was not aware of that, but I can look into it. If Obviously, we can accommodate it somehow. graduation has been uh, a oh, very dynamic, moving situation. <laughs> so and every, I will look into that. I'm grateful that we're having it. Mm -hmm. I'm just look into that if you can. I can. I, I think the concern is making sure we really want to emphasize to the kids. We're not congregating. You're going to come in with your family, leave with your family. We're not getting together and taking pictures here. So it, I think that was the, the reason for the emphasis. It, and the fact that they have to get their ticket. Mm -hmm. They have to come to – so if yes. we can look at that. Uh, I, I don't know if you've got any phone do. calls on that. Uh, the only other thing is if the governor doesn't see the light, uh, I would suggest that we look at having meetings – uh, via online instead of attempting to work through these masks. <laughs> okay. That's all I've got. Thank you, Doug. I guess I said left or right, but I'll violate that and go to Steve and work it way back around. So, Nothing for you? We didn't coordinate, by the way, on the blue mask thing, did we? I thought we did. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I couldn't guess, so I just went <laughs> <laughs> Leanna. The only thing I have um, is that I guess a huge thanks to our administrative team as we worked through all of, or as you worked through all of this, I guess I just kind of keep in mind that you see the other um, plans that are coming out of other districts, and I know that we run a very lean operation here at Big Walnut, and that there are the four of you who are here this evening, I mean, there's others in the background, but the countless hours, my guess is all of you are missing your families and missing your summer to try to safely reopen our schools. And I don't think um, that based on a lot of the comments that I've seen on Facebook, that a lot of people are keeping that in mind, that I just would ask people to assume that we always have our intentions are positive and that we are looking to do the very best for every child in this school district and if you have a question rather than getting on your keyboard and putting it out as a social media post that you reach out to an individual who might be able to give you the information or the answers you need and as Sherry mentioned, um, I have responded to lots of requests for information, and I appreciate those. Um, that when 
you are asking for the information in a respectful manner, we are always happy to respond and do whatever we can to get you directed to the right person if we don't know that answer. Uh, if I could just quickly thank you, Lana. I appreciate those kind words. And, and again, as we started with acknowledging all the work everyone's done, um, I do want to point out we have an email address that is for questions um, that we're all tag teaming so we can get on those questions right away and get you an answer as fast as possible. And that is questions at bwls.net. And that is on our reopening page. So if anyone has any additional questions, that's the quickest way to get an answer because we have several people checking and responding. And I guess I just echo kind of similar to Leanna's comments as well as Sherry's. Um, it's been a lot of time in my inbox in the last uh, last few days. Um, but honestly, I don't I don't really mind it. You all have questions, and I get it. I've got questions too. And um, beyond questions, there's things about our reopening plan that I don't necessarily like, and that I don't necessarily excited about. Um, but the reality of it is, is there is not one answer that's going to make everyone happy. Even I would say everybody sitting up here as a board member. And so to Leanna's point, I think what you're seeing is an attempt to make those decisions that are in the best interest for the children in our district with our community in mind, with our parents in mind, and with those that provide care for our students in mind as well as our staff and employees that are also committed to serving our students along the way. And I would say in my seven plus years or so doing this or however many years it's been, cut me in half and count the rings, I guess. Um, we've never just said we're gonna go do something and never adjust as things go on. And so while Jen talked a lot tonight about kind of formulating some things and getting some more answers for things, um, I would encourage you to look at the track record of this district and its ability to adjust and adapt as things evolve and have some faith that this district will continue to do those things. And then also recognize, though, that they may not be things that you personally agree with, but know that they're coming out of the spirit of what the district is believing is the best thing for the students in our community. So that's all I have for, for my comments. That brings us to item number 11, which is public participation. This is a meeting of the Board of Education and Public for the purpose of conducting school districts business and is not considered a public community meeting. It's a time for public participation during the meeting as indicated in the agenda. And please reference the specific criteria for public participation, which is attached to the agenda. And I know we're a little bit unique here with uh, social distancing and whatnot. So we made um, opportunities to participate available in two ways. One was in person. And the other is if anything was sent in. I guess I'll start in person. Mark, is anybody here to, to come in and make a statement? And he is shaking his head no if you can't hear that rattle on, uh, on our live stream. So we have nobody who's coming in person. And then, Jeremy, do you have anything that has been submitted for public comment? I have not seen anything while we've been here nor before. Okay. Did you did, have? Did you get anything? I did. I thought Jeremy was reading it. I can't. I did too. Oh. I'm sorry. I thought Jeremy had it. But if you've oh, got it, I we can go and read it. That's fine. Yes. I didn't realize you weren't copied on that. I no, apologize. That's maybe my fault. Um, this was sent by Georgia Craig, who is the president of our Big Walnut Education Association. Dear Board of Education members, thank you for your continuing service to our school community during very trying times. As we approach reopening our district, there are many concerns about safety issues for students, teachers, their families, and all of our community members. In June, many teachers, administrators, parents, and other community members gave their feedback on reopening our schools via the pandemic committee. The top choice of the committee was to bring our schools back to full face-to-face -face instruction with an online option. This top choice was followed by a hybrid option and a total remote option. The administration continues to work diligently to put together a face-to-face -face plan for our district under this parameter. Unfortunately, the trends regarding COVID-19 in our state and county are becoming worsening. We did not enjoy the reprieve from the virus, which we all hoped for during the summer months. As a result, many of our teachers are increasingly concerned about the safety and risks involved in coming back to school full-time with classrooms, hallways, and lunchrooms full of students. To best serve our members and their increasing concerns about safety, BWEA, the Big Walnut Education Association, has surveyed teachers and wishes to convey the results to our school community. 
46% of surveyed teachers report that either they or an immediate family member was in a high-risk group regarding COVID-19. 65% of surveyed teachers rated our current plan of reopening at the end of August, beginning of September as not very likely to be safe or not at all likely to be safe. 79% of teachers are not very confident or not at all confident that they can arrange their classrooms to safely social distance students. Many of our classrooms have tables instead of chairs. Even with 19% of students selecting a remote option, we will have full classrooms. When asked the safest option to reopen, 49.7% rate remote learning with higher expectations as the safest. 25.2% rate a hybrid option as the safest and 25.2% rate the current plan as the safest. Only 26% of our members would feel comfortable sending their school-aged children back to school with the district's current plan. When asked how safe they feel with the district's current plan, very safe, 10.4%, somewhat safe, 34.4%, not very safe, 35.6%, not safe at all, 19.6%. We ask that the board consider these results as it moves forward in making decisions to reopen our schools. These results reflect the current situation regarding the virus and certainly not the commitment of faculty and staff working on reopening plans. The situation in our state and county is ever evolving and decisions about opening safely may also have to evolve. All teachers in the district desperately want to see their students. However, concerns for safety are very real and present at this time. Regards, BWEA Executive Committee. Typically, we just comment uh, or we just read those comments in, but I guess I just have a couple questions for you related to that. Sure. Um, did we have any staff discussions kind of explaining our reopening plans or anything related to that that kind of talked them through where the plan was and what we were doing beyond the committee? Yes, we held two um, Google, a couple different sessions of Google Meets um, two times throughout the summer. Uh, most recently a week or so ago and we let them know obviously there are as I said before thousands of logistics that we're still working through those minute details um, but wanted to give them that big picture plan and then um, they had an opportunity to send questions to their principal uh, that we are working through next week during our administrative retreat because our entire retreat instead of being leadership training and Um, all those great things we do to grow our skills is that's not happening this year obviously we're we're just working on logistics so I told the staff that we would be sharing those answers once we have an opportunity to to work through details for each building um, in in a correspondence back okay Um, did you receive a phone call from any of the union leadership or any email expressing a concern about safety other than a public submission of their survey results I did receive something today after this was submitted a day after um, saying they were willing to help collaborate on a plan. Um, And and obviously I shared I would have liked to have received that prior to this public submission for a board meeting. It would have made it it easier to actually discuss as opposed to having to read it in as a comment. So I would agree with that. Anything else related to that that you would all like to comment on? I guess my only question would be um, what percentage of their membership actually took the survey and participated in the survey? It's a great question, and I do not know the answer because it wasn't shared as part of that. So that's something I would like to know as well. Yeah, I think a lot of these things, to Sherry's point, um, get resolved when we work together. And I'll just leave it there. Item 12.1. It's recommended to the board adopt the following student handbooks for the year 2020-2021. Preschool grade 6, grade 7 and 8, grades 9 to 12, and the athletic handbook. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Leanna. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Mark, come on up, please. Uh, thank you. Um, we had these uh, shared with you as a, what we thought was the final version at the time about a month ago, uh, after, right after the last board meeting. Um, we have had several revisions since between the date of uh, submission to you all and, and up to today, I uh, appreciate all the feedback from each of you. So each time I got feedback from some of you, I would take a look at that if revisions were made. I then sent you that email to follow up with, with additional attachments as needed. Um, so you've got the most recent as of this morning or this afternoon, I believe. Um, and that was just making a couple more 
it working okay? Wayne's either playing charades or... Uh, oh, sorry. My, guess, my apologies. <laughs> I couldn't tell. I just um, saw a hand gesture and <laughs> up, so... <laughs> but, uh, so with that, you know, I, we do expect there to be some changes as we go. There's just no way to uh, have this perfect for the first day of school outside of getting your approval tonight. Um, having those ready to go, and then if we need to make the adjustments, we, we will come back to you and request uh, additional approval as needed. Um, the fortunate piece to all this, and a few, a few uh, years ago, we switched over to approving these in the summertime uh, for any projected changes or adjustments that needed to be made closer to the year starting. We used to approve these in April or May um, <laughs> for, because of the printed uh, need for, for agendas and, and uh, to have all these printed out in time for the start of the year. So. Thankfully, we've at least been able to make several adjustments in preparation for this year based off of the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we do expect there still to be some that, depending on what, what continues to come down as legislators uh, make some decisions on things and as our, our governor makes decisions on things and health departments and our local board. Any questions on any of those handbooks, though? As far as the uh, mandating for the wearing of masks, has mm -hmm. that been sent through legal? Um, there hasn't been the specific statements have not been sent through legal no but the the mask mandate as far as having a mask mandate we've had several um, legal webinars that have essentially said that schools can require masks to be worn by anybody coming into the buildings now we have to allow for the uh, if there's a medical issue we have to allow for that just as the governor has given that guidance as well for the, the mask mandate um, we are looking at if there is a medical exemption or other exemption that we have to look for, uh, we do try to look to see if a face shield would work in place. Um, as of right now, our health department has not given approval for a face shield to be um, an alternative to face masks, uh, unless there is a medical exemption or other reason, uh, which was in the governor's reopening plan, such as teaching students that are hearing impaired, um, that require you know, to be able to read lips, um, students that uh, have maybe English as a second or, or other language um, in, in other cases like that uh, primary learning with phonics some of those pieces there are allowances for face shields to be worn by teachers um, but we are still looking for there to potentially be um, some of that as has Franklin County some of those districts have allowed for face shields to be worn instead of masks mm -hmm. because their county uh, health director has has seen that interpretation to allow for it um, not all health directors have seen it that way my concern is the fact that if we mandate it, mm -hmm. then we police it. Correct. And we take on the liability issues of it. If the health department wants to mandate it, why aren't their people going to come and do the policing? Um, I think just as it is with everything else, even though some of the, the requirements in there are state laws that are in the handbooks, we still have to police it because the students are our responsibility on our grounds. Um, so just as some of the other pieces that you'll see in there that relate to uh, drugs and paraphernalia, um, other um, acts of harassment, acts of bullying, those are, those are things that are not just against the school handbook, but they're against the law. We still police that. So I would look at this as a similar situation. I, I just, I don't believe we ought to be going into the policing and doing the job of the health department okay any other questions or thoughts on things i guess i would just add related to, to doug's point i guess i feel like with 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 what we know and kind of back to sherry's point about scientific knowledge of how to prevent mm -hmm. we got a social distance where we can and if we can't I think masks are just a requirement and, right. and and as I've stated personally I feel like the best thing for our kids is to be back in school and I think if if the cost of that is wearing a mask then at least I think in these times we have to be prepared to pay that in my opinion in my opinion well I would point out that the sheriff of this county is not going to police the governor's mask mandate I'm just questioning why we want to take that responsibility on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not yeah. saying. It's not a responsibility. Not we didn't ask for it. Yeah, yeah. We want to do that. I, I appreciate that. But I, <laughs> but I guess I look at it from a, as a management issue, so to speak. And I know I had a question from a parent asking, you know, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm happy to send my daughter back. 
but I'm, I really only want to do that if I know that masks are being worn. And so mm-hmm. I think there's a, a segment of our community that's looking for us to make sure that if we're committing to that, that we're following right. through with that. And so I guess I personally feel like having something in the handbook that allows us to be able to, to, to manage against that um, is probably the only way we've got to be able to do that. Although I recognize what you're saying, the yeah. challenge of um, taking on the responsibility of making that happen. Yeah. This is a true uh, situation, just like every other piece in logistics that this pandemic has thrown every school district into at this point. Is a lot of these we would never expect to have been on our responsibility list, um, but when we look at a reopening plan and guidelines that tell us that we need to have these things in place, uh, especially on the inside, uh, on the indoors, uh, knowing that we won't be able to manage to get to a six foot distancing in every single situation in a school environment, it's just not feasible um, to recognize that this is a safe way, a, an opportunity for us to so show consideration and safety toward others um, is a huge step for us. And I think it's not just a requirement that we're just handing down and saying that we're going to police and enforce, but I think it's also a recognition of a, the culture that we have in our district of caring for others and, and just an opportunity to continue to show that as well. Any other questions on handbooks? Thank you, Mark. All right, thank you. Jeremy, I think that leaves you free to call the vote. Okay. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Fuji? Yes. Mr. Crow? No. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. Mr. Schne- Schneider? <laughs> Both of them said yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? that doesn't count as two votes, right? That's no, no. Right. Un- unfortunately, no. Good to know. <laughs> All right. Item 12 2, it's recommended the board approve the revised 2020 2021 school calendar. Can I have a motion, please? Move. So moved. Thank you, Steve. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Leanna. Leanna, do you want to speak to this? I, I would like to, yes. Um, this is something I know a lot of districts are doing because of the scramble that we're in to try to get all these logistics figured out and um, just as importantly, train our staff and students on um, new hygiene and safety expectations as well as expectations for uh, if we are to go back into crisis remote learning and the program that that Jen referenced earlier um, we need time to do that and so we are looking at instead of bringing students back on August 19th that first full week would be for staff training Uh, and then we would look at the week of the 24th as a staggered start so what we're looking at there and we're working out those exact what that staggering looks like but we want to bring kids in in very small cohorts that week so that we can spend some time taking them around the building showing them all the expectations in the different spaces um, just getting some of those new expectations spelled out because obviously this is not going to be a typical start to the year for our students they're coming many of them into a familiar space that now has very different expectations And so we want to be able to spend some time making sure that we have a successful year, um, setting everyone up for success by making sure we have adequate training with that. And we are obviously working with our health department and our school nurses on preparing those trainings. Um, The following week on the 31st, then we would have all students who are doing the in-person learning would be reporting. And so given your approval tonight our team will be working next week on exactly what that week of the 24th will look like and then we will communicate that out to families um, as well as what does it look like for students that are doing the virtual learning program during that initial week so we're going to work through we have some ideas on that but um, all of our principals come back on monday and so we want to kind of work through and make some decisions on that and then we'll message that out the rest of the calendar is the same and um, the days the week of the 24th do count as student days and the PD days also we're able to do because we meet we're exceeding the minimal hours already for kids and so there will not be a need to add any additional days on the back end or take away any break days uh, we, we feel this is important so that the days the kids are here we're prepared and, and ready to do the best possible job that we can with them on a side fringe benefit this does help us with prairie run elementary because of the issues that that doug referenced earlier we've had some covid related delays and um, with the water issue that we had so this gives us a little bit more time just to get that building buttoned up and and ready to go 
as well. Well, and just to clarify, when you say COVID-related delays, because I recognize not everybody attends every meeting, the COVID-related delays you're referring to are supplies and equipment yes, that thank you were for that. not provided <laughs> because other places were shut down earlier in the year Correct. and not a health-related COVID issue. Thank you. We have had no cases reported on our job site as of now. Um, that's absolutely correct. For example, we had cabinetry that came out of Michigan and that was not deemed essential. So that was on back order. Um, but yes, those are the delays, um, just issues with implementing some of the social distancing practices and things that they needed to do on the site. But uh, no, it is not because of an outbreak of COVID. It was because of a supply chain issue. Okay. Any comments or questions on the calendar? D has DAC said when they're starting yet? Um, they have not. They are putting their plan out on July 30th. They were waiting to get all, because they work with so many districts, they wanted everybody else's plans. Um, but I think it'll be fairly aligned to this because we have talked about, um, it's not all the exact day in every district, but everybody's bumping back a little bit just for the same reasons that I outlined today. So they're supposed to, they have a meeting on July 30th and they plan to present uh, their plan at that point. So, no, we don't have that yet. Did you give it any, any thought to pushing it behind Labor Day? We did. Um, that would require adding some days on the end of the year. And so we know um, with the notice and people already having things planned, we didn't want to take away a break that was already uh, advertised to people. They may have planned a family event. So uh, that's kind of why we stayed where we were. All right. Anything else on the calendar? Mr. Fuji? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Kral? Yes. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. Item 12-3, it's recommended to the board approve the memorandum of understanding between Delaware County Probate Juvenile Court and the Big Walnut Local School District as a means of defining the limited relationship shared with in regard to the school liaison program. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Leanna. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Sherry. And I just noticed my name is not the right name on this agreement. <laughs> <laughs> to get that changed. Um, <laughs> thank you. This is um, something that you approve every year. This is our uh, partnership with the courts on uh, working with our students who have attendance issues. I will put uh, some clarification there because we know we have a lot of families that are worried about how we're going to track attendance. And obviously, um, we will be taking the, the COVID issues into account, but this person is also able to reach out if we have students that are in the virtual program and, and not logging on, for example. This is a resource not only with our in-person students, but also with the academy. And I know Mark's had some conversations with her because she has already um, worked with some of the other schools in the county. Olentangy, for example, has had an online academy, and she's familiar with working in that environment. So. Um, this is just a, a nice resource for us to get some early intervention for families when there are attendance issues. And again, not medically related to COVID, but genuine attendance issues. Um, so we can intervene and get that student back on track. Any questions? Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. Mr. Crowell? Yes. Mr. Fuji? Yes. And Mr. Schneider? Yes. That brings us to item 13 in the human resources report. Welcome back. Make sure your mic is on. <laughs> the mic <laughs> is on. Uh, just a couple items here for you this evening for your uh, request for your approval. First of all, 13.1, uh, we did manage to um, complete our conversations and negotiations with our OC 524. So we do have that contract up for your approval this evening. Um, did take us a little bit longer than expected, but I do appreciate all the leadership and the, the work that uh, we were able to collaborate with in reviewing this contract and, and um, uh, making the changes to the contract that uh, will help our district uh, continue to move forward on things. Uh, definitely feel that it is a fair uh, compensation plan as well for our employees. Um, as they do a lot of that hard work, especially considering uh, the work that our custodians are doing to keep the buildings clean and, and disinfected this coming year, uh, the work that our bus drivers are doing and getting our kids transported, 
taking care of keeping those clean, those buses clean, and, and just all the other workers that are within this group, uh, just add a ton of value to our district. So we appreciate their their work in helping us to to, to get to this point. Uh, under 13.2, um, I uh, spoke a little bit earlier to the fact that we had a preschool intervention specialist on here. Again, that is ultimately an FTE ad, uh, one out of the three that we had projected for this year. Um, and uh, we are excited to have Kendall potentially join us with your approval here. Um, Zachary Wat Watson also is a replacement school counselor, replacing Rick Kavikia, who had retired. That is a 0.25 ad because Rick uh, was a 0.75 counselor uh, by FTE. So that we do feel that um, if anything, we, we need to be uh, more well equipped with school counselors and the mental health support that our kids continue to need um, for, for what they're going through now and, and ju just in their general lives. So we have the replacement position there for your approval as well tonight. Under 13.3 extended days, these are annual extended days that um, are given to our uh, counselors at the high school, as well as um, Kristen Macklin there under the high school, but she also oversees all of our libraries and prepare, um, in preparing them for another year. Uh, the middle school, the two counselors there, the intermediate school, our counselor there, and the district with Katie Yeager being our gifted coordinator in preparation for our written education plans and supporting our students uh, with their, their gifted needs. Um, and so with the counselors, the vast majority of that is re regarding scheduling. It's a large job. Um, they do put in some hours as well over the summer at the end of the year to help with transcripts, to help with um, you know, continual guidance to our students as they, they move forward um, with their decisions over the summertime and moving past uh, their schooling experience here in Big Walnut. Um, one thing I would like to note is that there is the potential because of all the changes in schedules. Uh, Jen spoke a while ago about having to go through those 200 plus schedules of students at the high school even, of um, looking at each individual schedule to see how can we support them this year and, and finding those uh, learning options, including those remote option, the remote options and, and the credits that they need. Um, so we do expect them to be really be working hard to get those individualized schedules figured out. Um, so with that, there is the potential that we may need some additional days uh, with their agreement and with your approval. Uh, we will come back to you if that's the case to talk with you about that. And then under 13.4, um, just noting the two MOUs or memorandums of understanding that we have with our Big Wona Education Association. The first one is related to supplementals of our coaches. Uh, you'll note there with that it is based off of what occurs this year, uh, again, crazy times with things. Um, we were put into the put into this disaster last spring um, with the with the pandemic, and made things work. And we appreciate all the coaches' work over the springtime to to get that done. Um, as we now can be a little more proactive with things going into the entire year, if the school district gets shut down, um, if plans change just with sports, uh, we have we believe a, a really good plan with our teachers union on how those supplementals will be paid out, um, honoring the coaches for the work that they have done, but not necessarily paying them the full amount if, if a, a year doesn't take place. Um, the other MOU there is just noting the school calendar. Due to the, the changes ma being made to the school calendar, the, the contract is very specific about how many student days there are, how many teacher professional development days there are, and so we did have to make some changes there to allow for, and what's uh, earlier in public session, you heard the concerns that they have. This is one way that we are addressing those concerns. Uh, we will have, we typically have one PD day with teachers at the beginning of the year. This allows us to have uh, four out of the first five days uh, to help our teachers with planning, to get their input on things um, as we make final preparations for the year as well. Um, and so with that, we would, we would ask for your approval of that MOU as well. And then 13.5. Uh, just noting there, the athletic supplemental contracts for the fall, that's a pretty standard uh, each year. we just approving those. 13.6, uh, Patty Tarney has chosen to retire at the end of October here this year. Uh, certainly has done a great job. I had the opportunity to work with her when I was at Big Wona Elementary and really appreciate all she's done for the district and our kids. And then under 13.7, just noting there, two leave of absences uh, that have been requested from our teachers mm -hmm. and those are in, um, in alignment with the, the contractual agreement that we have. A lot of things there. I thought they were, that would go a little quicker, but any questions <laughs> on any of those things? 
right, Anyone from you. the board? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Bring this to item 13-1. It's recommended the board approve the negotiated agreement between the OAPSE, AFSME. Mr. President. Yes. The, for consent agenda 13-1 through 13-7. There's a motion for consent on items 13-1 through 13-7. One second. There's a second. Jeremy, I think that leaves you to call the vote. Okay. Mr. Fuji. Yes. Mrs. Lee. Yes. Mr. Crow. Yes. Mrs. Dorsch. Yes. Mr. Schneider. Yes. Item 14, schedule, schedule of our next board meetings. The next two regularly scheduled board meetings are August 13th at 7.30 a.m. right here and in person. Second meeting, August 20th, that following Thursday at 6.30 p.m., again right here and in person. Item 15, point one, it's recommended the board enter an executive session to consider the employment appointment of a public employee or official and to consider matters required to be kept confidential by federal law or regulations or state statutes. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Jeremy, whenever you're ready. Mr. Fuji. Yes. Mrs. Lee. Yes. Mr. Crow. Yes. Mrs. Dorsch. Yes. Mr. Schneider. Yes. It is possible that we may come back out of public session, or excuse me, out of executive session tonight to take action on an item. If that's the case, we will appear back on the live stream. Well, we're going to appear back one way or the other. We're either going to appear back to to move to adjourn, or if we end up taking action, we're going to take that action and then move to adjourn. So thank you all for attending and, and watching along tonight. And we'll take five or so and get to executive session. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Public, public employee. We good to go. We good to go. We good to go. We good to go. Test 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 test. All right, it is 8:44 by my clock, and we are coming out of executive session. And is there a motion to be made? Oh, no, no, no. I'm looking for you to go ahead and read the okay. read the motion that we are going to discuss um, after executive session. Yeah, Brad, I move that we approve the settlement agreement with Levesque Commercial Construction and Development, LLC, and International Fidelity Insurance Company. All right, so Leanna has a motion. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Sherry. 
Jeremy, you can go ahead and call the vote when however you are ready. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. Mr. Crowell? Yes. Uh, Mr. Fuji? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. All right, and then I would go ahead and make a motion to go back into executive session to discuss the employment of a public employee or an official. Is there a motion? Or I guess I made the motion, didn't I? Is there a second? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mr. Schneider? Yes. Mr. Fuji? Yes. Mr. Crowell? Yes. Mrs. Dorsch? Yes. Mrs. Lee? good I just want to make sure you got through everybody yep. all right yep so we don't anticipate coming back out of executive session to take any public action thanks if you hung around for that exciting update talk to you later